Hey everyone, it's the Kung Fu Genius, AKA Alex Richter. And I just wanna let you know that if you're a Wing Chun practitioner, especially from the WT or Leung Ting line, and you wanna get really personalized, intensive private training with me, you can now apply to do an immersion course with me here in NYC, or if you like the sun, in my Florida home near Orlando. These courses are for instructors or anyone who's serious about learning the art in detail and working hard. I teach in program blocks like Siunam Tao, Chum Q, Byuji, and Wooden Dummy. And those include the Chi Sao Theory fighting applications and training methods as well. If you're really serious about learning Wing Chun, check out the link in the description below to find out about applying for a spot. And while you're here, don't forget to subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius on YouTube, like this video and share it on your social media platforms. And with that, let's get started. All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems, lots of animal styles, Lots of, you gonna let Bruce Lee dent your car, homie? Let's get to it. He is unstoppable, unbeatable, unbelievable. He's Alex Richter, the Kung Fu genius. And every day, I practice martial arts. <laughs> Word is, I'm a Kung Fu genius. Practiced all day like a genius. <laughs> Yo, Dre, how you doing, man? I'm doing Gucci. You are See doing you. Gucci. You just got back from vacation, man, and I saw those vacation photos. Look at you. You're all tan. You were on the beach, so living that kind of life. You were living relaxed. the kind of lifestyle that yeah. people think the Kung Fu genius lives, <laughs> but you're the one actually living it. So how, how was your how was your vacation? Only four or five days. Four, four, yeah, four or only. five days of paradise. Yeah, oh you were where you were in Puerto Rico, right? Grand Reserve Resort. In, the Grand Reserve in, Resort in Rio Grande, Puerto Rico. Wow, amazing! We did the El Yunque like uh, zip lining. Wow, we did a lot of dancing and then just, I don't dance, but right, was, she was embarrassed the whole time. You can do the you can do the Van you can do the Van Dam though. <laughs> And you can do the Nathan Road. The Nathan Road is is the real. <laughs> That's what's up. That is the real. So, uh, oh man, shout out to my girl for putting up with me uh, this vacation dancing and That's all amazing. the other other things that we've uh, done. She and, doesn't watch this podcast though. It doesn't but matter. But still, you know. So. <laughs> but anyway, you know what's weird? You were on vacation last week, but you still recorded an episode with us. But you sounded different. You had like a British <laughs> accent. It was crazy. <laughs> I know. I know, and I, you had like a little more hair, it. man. I flipped it. Yeah, you, you the many faces of yeah, Dre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, man. It was tough, but. Uh, I tell you what about that Dre, though. He, he knew how to speak English. <laughs> he knew. <laughs> he knew all of a sudden. Suddenly he knew how to speak he English. He knew all of a sudden. Like the abonics just went out the window on him. <laughs> just threw that shit away. He went proper. He went proper. That's right. That episode. All right. So here we are for another Ask Me Anything episode. Yeah. And, uh, what we got? Like, this well, is 33 or something like that? Yeah, this is 33. Last, uh, I didn't have an episode last week because uh, I was away in Florida yeah. uh, setting up the new, um, you know, the new How's training that coming? facility. It's coming along. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so the, so we couldn't. Wooden dummy yet? The wooden dummy's on its way. Okay. Uh, so we couldn't record a regular episode. So mm. what I did was we have that series with Dr. Kenneth J, the legit or nah, where we talk about yeah. training montages. And I decided to release the Rocky Four one uh, in lieu of having a regular episode. So and now we're kind of back. And uh, for our kind of Bruce Lee uh, lovers over here, um, we're going to do some pretty awesome Bruce Lee related content coming oh, you, up in the next few. You ready for that? Yeah, there, there are a couple more phone conversations which we talked about mm. before. There's the Ted Thomas interview and there's also the Alex Ben Block interview. They're both also audio recordings. Who's and, uh, Ted Thomas again? Ted Thomas, I think he's a reporter. Um, okay. Yeah, and he interviewed Bruce while Bruce was filming Enter the Dragon. Wow. So I think Bruce was like taking a break from the set and so that's like about a 14 minute conversation yeah. and then the Alex Ben Block one is about 22 minutes Yeah. and so there's a lot to talk about so we'll do some Similar to what we did with the um, Dan Lee secretly recorded phone conversation. Okay. And we'll listen to it. We'll break it down and we'll see if we can get any gems out of there. And also, you know, in light of like, you know, the Bob Baker letters and stuff like that, there may be some things we could pick up that maybe we didn't, wouldn't have known You know before. what I noticed? What? You, you had Charles Damiano. Yes. I don't know if it's him or if it's Victor. I'm dude Victor, the collector. You mean Hector? Hector. <laughs> Hector, the collector. You're always you're always the guy <laughs> who gets the names, names wrong, right? <laughs> name Botcher. Yeah, you know that dude Brian. His name's Bruce. <laughs> His name is Bruce. You know Brian Lee. Yeah, yeah no. Brian Lee. Yeah, right, right. So uh, one of those, either uh, they got the blue 
Tigers from Bruce Lee's uh, filming of man, what was that? Sh- the, where, where what do you mean, Tigers? The, blind you mean guy, the, the sneakers. The sneakers. He's he's literally he's teaching the blind guy. Oh, you mean from fight. Long Street? From Long, Long Street. Street. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he has the blue tigers on. Yeah, the Anatukas. Yeah. Who had it? Charles had it or Bruce. Hector had it? Oh, okay. Bruce. But I'm not sure who had They have them in the right. background of one of their videos or something. Got it, got I it, think, got it. I think it was Charles and uh, Hector Yeah, they together. do They do a lot together. They do it in uh, in Charles's basement, which, by the way, I was just there on Sunday. Did Char- you see the, sh- the shoes there? Well, I saw all sorts of stuff, but I wasn't looking for the shoes in particular. Uh, Charles had me over because, you know, he did one episode of the Kung Fu Genius. Mm-hmm. And then I went over to his house mm. a- into his little man cave there with all his Bruce Lee collectibles. Oh. And then uh, he did an interview with Sweet. me for his channel. So, uh, oh. I, yeah, I don't know when that's. I mean, by the time this episode comes out, that one might be out already or it might be coming out soon. But uh, I did uh, Charles Damiano's yeah. uh, YouTube channels. And so that'll be coming up. And that was a lot of fun. I brought some of my Bruce Lee collectibles over to him, but he's like a legit collector. So me, like, <laughs> I, I have like, like a couple things. They're more sentimental. You're all kindergarten with your little. Yeah, I, 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 I told him like he's got Bruce Lee signatures. He's got all this stuff. I'm like, I got some stuff. Um, <laughs> and you know, it's kind of like me going to him and saying, you know, I'm a Bruce Lee collector. It's like someone coming up to me who did martial arts for three weeks when yeah. they were a kid and going, yeah, I did karate. Uh, yeah, so right. I'm like, you know, I'm like you. I'm a martial artist, right? <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to that. So you know, it comes to mind uh bruce lee he does might have inspired the uh slang kicks you think so sneakers yeah he might have inspired it it's possible people call him kicks all the time you know it's crazy when we went to puerto rico we rented a car it was a blue nissan kick like in street fighter where chun lee goes nissan kick we were like, what? That's, well, that's probably like... Wow, that's crazy. Literally, the kicks is, is the model of the Nissan. Wow, Nissan that's crazy. Kicks. That's crazy. Yeah, is... So we got some questions, right? So let's get to it. First up, Jack Dawson. All right. It's a cool name. It's like straight out of... Uh, Dawson's Creek. Eight. <laughs> I was going to say 18, but he's an 18 villain. All right. Are there wooden dummy or equivalent training forms... That use weapons. This is like a 17-parter question. 17-part yeah. question. Okay, yeah, yeah. all right. Give me the first part first. That's it. Are there wooden dummy or equivalent training forms that use weapons? Uh, in Yip Man Wing Chun, no. Mm. Um, I mean, of course, that doesn't mean you can't go on YouTube and find some guy who's uh, hitting a wooden <laughs> dummy with a scream of sticks oh, right, or right. using a knife on a wooden dummy or something like that, right? Just chopping yeah, it Yeah, chopping away, arms. right? Okay, or the thing that wooden <laughs> dummy fears most, an axe. Um, <laughs> I know how to beat this wooden dummy, an a-, a chainsaw, right? Okay. Yeah, no, obviously not in, in Yip Man Wing Chun, no. Okay. Um, in some of the other... Um, Related styles, like uh, in uh, Siulam Wang Chun, which is Wang, the eternal spirit, I've heard of right? this, yeah. The, the Tsim Wang Chun, right? They, they have something called a pole dummy. And the pole dummy is basically, it's a number of poles that are kind of coming out. It's almost like coming out of a wall. Mm. And they're, I don't know how many of them, maybe there's six, maybe there's nine. I don't remember. You have to, we'll have to get someone on here who's an expert in those things. And basically, it's a dummy for training the long pole. Ooh. Right, but that is, uh, I think it's called Guan. Zhong. Guan, Guan is pole and Zhong is like dummy. Uh, and so that is specifically for training the Lok Tim Bun Guan, right? Um, but that's not like the normal wooden dummy, the one that people are thinking of when they think of wooden dummy. It's like, it's kind of like a wall with poles coming out of it. <laughs> so uh, I remember when I was learning the long pole from Sifu Lang Ting, and um, one of the issues I had is I was learning the long pole. Uh, but obviously I didn't have any students yet who were learning it because I was already teaching and the long pole is very advanced. So I started learning the long pole from Sifu Lang Ting. And then when Sifu Carson Lao would come over to my school to teach seminars, I would do some private training with him in, uh, in the long pole. And he gave me this like brilliant method of training the long pole on my own, which was to go to the wooden dummy take one of the wooden dummy's arms out and stick a long pole in the in, in that wow. hole instead. So then basically you have a you have a long pole sticking out of the wooden dummy. And then he showed me a number of methods to uh, train on my own to improve like the skills because I didn't have a partner. Yeah, so that was pretty awesome. So that's like a modification, kind of modifying the dummy and using a, a pole in there to train the long pole. But other than that, I mean, no, I mean, in traditional 
classic Yip Man Wing Chun that's not really uh, the idea. The pole is practiced uh, through strength training, form, and Qi Guan and Lat Guan sparring with a partner. And the knife is also trained through form and basics and then, you know, some kind of, as much as you can replicate safe sparring with knives, um, it's mostly about the interaction and not so much about training it on dummies. So what's, mm -hmm. the, what's the next part of those questions? When you were still very new to WT, what did you enjoy practicing the most? That's a good, I, I liked practicing something called Lutso. Now the Lutso that was practiced back then is not the Lutso the way I understand it now. It's what's now known as the European Lutso. There was like a European Lutso exercise, which was like this puck punch from an advancing stance with a partner. And then from there, you built in different types of non-Wing Chun attacks and Wing Chun stuff. And it was kind of like a little bit of a a, uh, a bridge between like normal sparring and Qi Sao, right? And it was something that was designed in Europe. And that was called Lutso. Now, that's not what the Chinese call Lutso. That was a specific exercise that was designed in Europe. But when I first started learning WT, I wasn't learning the Hong Kong system. I was learning the European system. Right. And that was a lot of fun. I used to have a lot of fun doing that. And that was probably, yeah, probably one of the most fun things that I did at that time. Follow up. With your current experience, would you advise your past self to practice something else a little more at the beginning? Yes. Well, I mean, the way I teach Wing Chun now is very different from the way I learned it, right? Mm. And, of course, some people might look at me or some of my students might look at me and 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 if they like my skills, they might say, well, I want to learn it the way I learned it or whatever. And I, I don't think most I don't think it's reasonable for people to learn it the way I learned it. <laughs> I was traveling all over the place, learning this from this guy, went to a castle in Germany for three years. Then I'm going to Hong Kong and I had to like travel and go to all these different places to put everything together. Um, it, and I spent a lot of time doing things that um, were not as important as I thought they were. But it's difficult to say because I am where I am now because of those things. So it's it's difficult. Uh, um, if I could go back and and find that version of myself and give them advice, I, I probably would just give them advice about dealing with certain people. But I would say just stay on the same path. You're you'll it's kind of the right path for you. So <laughs> okay. you'll just watch out through it. Watch out for this guy and watch out for people who tell you this. Watch out, right? All right. Uh, next part. What do you remember most about beginning your WT journey and what might you say in that light to anyone that might be starting out with the same passion? Well, for me, I, I had done years of non-classical Wing Chun before I came to WT. So for me, WT wasn't the first Wing Chun I had experienced, but WT was very different from what I had learned before. I was doing the kind of Bruce Lee non-classical Wing Chun before I did WT. So I... I had a lot of adjustments. Now I'm learning form. We didn't do forms in the non-classical Wing Chun. I have to learn like turning and shifting and all of these skills that weren't even part of my previous training. Some of the things obviously the same. I mean, Wing Chun to a certain degree is Wing Chun, right? Like like Bruce Lee said, Gong Fu is Gong Fu, right? Mm. Wing Chun is still Wing Chun, right? You have different flavors and different emphasis, right? Um, so there were some things that were the same. There were some things that were different. I had to learn like a whole new stance, a whole new way of moving. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's difficult for me to, to think about what kind of advice would I give anyone because one thing you learn after teaching, you know, for as long as I have, which is now almost 20 years, is that the advice, there is no general advice. Mm. You know, like people, people, people want to hear like, what is this like general nugget of wisdom you would give that would make everything fine? And my experience is such a thing doesn't exist because the thing I need to tell you for you to have a breakthrough or an understanding is different than what I need to tell that other person, right? Because for one person, their issues might be physical. For the other person, it might be mental. Mm -hmm. For the other person, it might be giving up what they had learned before and trying to embrace something new. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's impossible to say, like, this is the one thing you should tell everybody because that might be super meaningful for one person, super obvious for someone else, and completely meaningless for a third person. Mm -hmm. Would it make sense to combine WT with any of the animal forms? Uh, well, I'm not really qualified for that because I don't really know any animal forms. I don't <laughs> know. Maybe the one thing that's really missing from my Wing Chun is uh, snake style. I don't know. What about the uh, animal forms that uh, Lung Ting came up with for 
for the venoms. Yeah. Yeah, but those are fictitious yeah, animal well, styles, right? Like no centipede animal, and no stuff like that, yeah. right? There's one animal form that everyone always forgets: hamster style. <laughs> hamster style. Yes, yes. Was that from <laughs> from, from Kung Pao, right? right? Enter from, the fist. No, 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 no. It's from Orgasmo. Oh, okay. Orgasmo. <laughs> Our sound person, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> referencing Orgasmo on the Kung Fu Genius. Is right? that just straight running? Just straight running <laughs> from your enemy? <laughs> oh, hamster style. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think that that's a common misconception. The problem of mixing styles. Uh, because one, that's extremely individual. Mm. Um, it depends on the individual and their their temperament, their attitude, the amount of training they have. I think for, for people who are casual martial art practitioners, meaning like people who come two to three times a week to training and they're just doing it for fun, yeah, I don't think that they put in enough time mm, to to to, 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 to decide to one easily mix or to to really go into the, the problem with the mixing stuff is like, and I always say it is my favorite line. It's like people barely dip their nuts in one style before they decide they're a fully an expert on it. And yeah. now, oh, you know, the thing that's missing with Wing Chun is, uh, you know. XYZ style and it's like and they have not even really gone through that kind of depth in Wing Chun to be qualified yeah. to say something like that. Yeah, yeah. And so we're assuming for the argument's sake that the person who wants to mix the styles is someone who's actually a legitimate expert in Wing Chun first How and long? not one of these many chuckleheads who do, does Wing Chun for three months and then decides they're going to improve it, right? How much of their nuts do they have to dip? All of them. All of their nuts. All of the nuts. Yes, exactly. Right. Up to the nuts. All yeah, the way, right. all yes. way up. Because it's about going in the water, yeah. right? You need to let go at least yeah. that deep, right? Is it like 25 years? Some, wow. Well, it takes about 25 it's years. It's not to about dip the time. The it's, not, it's, it's not about the time. It's, it's about the intensity of the time someone does it, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, there, uh, <clears throat> Sifu Langteng has students in the States who were learning with him since the late 70s, early 80s, but they were learning during seminars and they never really trained super hard. Mm. And, you know, if you look at the amount of time, the, they, how long ago they started Wing Chun, you would have this expectation. But when you see these guys, these guys were, paper tigers going to seminars right mm -hmm. then you got guys who learned in europe or who learned in hong kong a quarter of the time or half the time who are legit high level sifus and qualified and could really teach people and are very Safe. skillful Comfort. so the, the it's not amount it's not about the amount of years it's amount it's about the amount of time you put in those years right because people love to tell you when they started something yeah but how hard did you actually train in that time period right mm. so it's an individual thing i don't know because we, fighting is about being you have to have a a game plan and a concept when you fight and if your game plan is to get close to your opponent and to smother them as let's say is the case in wing chun then I don't know if it makes sense to bolt on some random animal movements there that mm -hmm. are not necessarily congruent with that aim. Now, if you can somehow integrate it, okay, fine, but I don't really see what is missing in Wing Chun that you need to, like, look, Wing Chun, we have, uh, and I'm not saying that, uh, and this is not to say anything about the other styles because they also have all those things too, but in Wing Chun, you have the fist, you have the palm, you have the edge of the hand with the chan sao, the spade. You have, uh, you know, bottom fist. You have fox sao. You mm. have elbow. You have variations on the palm, variations on the punches. You have the straight punch, the lifting punch, the hooking punch. You have all of these different methods of striking. We even grab. You have neck pulling hands, throat grabs. I got. You have all this stuff. So what? What tool are we actually missing in terms of a drill bit, right? So I think that it it it, it just it comes from people maybe having a very superficial understanding of Wing Chun. And also, in my opinion, the thing that makes animal styles uh, sp special, mm -hmm. all right, whether you're talking about like a tiger style or dragon or whatever, is not the physical techniques of that style. Though those forms are very cool and they're very elegant. But it's that in order to fight using those styles, you have to, to a certain degree, adopt the, uh, the attributes of that animal all right. So, for example, the tiger is extremely vicious. So you don't use tiger claw with the idea of giving way and yielding and being soft because that is not the character of a tiger. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's why for people who do the different animal styles, in my opinion, they almost have to find the one that speaks to them the most because that is the one that's going to make sense. And that's the one that's going to work for them. Right. You don't just randomly bolt on tiger style. 
uh, when you're trying to give way with bong sao, for okay. example, right? right. It's like, that doesn't make sense, right? Yeah. So um, I think that there's an element of that. When you look at the, the practitioners of the various animal styles, the guys who are at really high level, they, 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 you can see why that is their style of choice, right? Like you look at Sifu Paul Ko here in New York. Um, he teaches um, a, a very, well, he teaches the black tiger style, right? But it's also, there's also a lot of elements of Hongkun in there. But like tiger is the main thing. And you see when he stands there, like when he's in his postures, like he's like a tiger. He looks like a tiger. He's got that mm. viciousness. He's strong. And you go, yeah, that is really a style that, that, that makes a lot of sense for him. Spoke of course, him. of course he does other animal styles as well, but you're like, he's like a tiger, right? When you look at something more exotic, like the monkey style, and you'll get someone like Pauli Zink, or you look at the late Sifu Chan Sao Chong, and you look at the way they move and you look at like the way they're kind of like sneaky and they're very flexible and all that. And they're kind of very almost like they fight in a very shifty kind of way. You go, yeah, that's the monkey right there. Right. And so that absolutely makes sense to to have something that it that somewhat speaks to your character. So you can do Wing Chun in that kind of way, because when you look at the Wing Chun world, you look at someone like Sifu Leung Teng, or you look at Bruce Lee, or Gary Lam, or uh, Wan Kam Leung, or Choi Jung Tin, or you look at all of these famous Wing Chun practitioners, and they're all very high level. None of them do Wing Chun the same way. Mm -hmm. Although, at, at the core, at the root, it's essentially the same art. But everyone expresses the art in their own way. So to a certain degree, we might not be identifying that as like a tiger way of doing Wing Chun or a dragon way of doing Wing Chun. But there, there, that way a Sifu expresses their Wing Chun shows their character, right? The, the, you know, the, the one guy is you know, very powerful, so his Wing Chun is going to be about using power and expressing power. The other one is, is a little more... Uh, kind of sneaky, almost mm -hmm. in a way like a monkey is going to be more about using angles and giving way and being kind of sneaky like that. Uh, the other person is going to be very dynamic and a very quick and dynamic striker. So they have elements of like a snake, like a viper, right? The other one is going to like to hold and control. He's going to be like a snake, but more like a constrictor. Yeah. So I think that you can think about finding your own personal expression of the Wing Chun. And I think that goes beyond... Uh, looking for mere physical techniques of an animal style. That's lit. That's lit. No, I, I get that because Wing Chun spoke to me. Um, when I'm in my element or if I'm bouncing and I we throw people out. <laughs> yes. And, and, and we, we <laughs> it, there was always moments where we would throw people out and maybe a few minutes after I'm back at my post and I'm just like, <laughs> and you know, I think one thing that maybe our listeners don't realize about you, because we've known you for years, yeah. is your shadow, your silhouette, looks exactly <laughs> like Grandmaster Yip Man. But people don't realize that. If you cast the light on Dre against uh -huh. the white background. Without looking see, at me, but look at the yeah, shadow. Yeah, with the yeah, bald head yeah. and everything like that, but even like the shape of your nose, everything like that. Yeah. You swear you're looking <laughs> at the silhouette of Yip Man. We just need to put the like the, the, the right. wide Chinese pants mm -hmm. on you, and, and, yeah. and there you go, man. We got to flip that one day. Yeah. Okay, folks. So with Jack Dawson, still with him. Holy follow cow. Up. The whole episode is going to be his question. <laughs> the Jack no, Dawson just episode. Just one question. Oh, one more question. Right? He got one question, but they're follow-ups, right? So uh, the last part of it, but if you could, though, which ones would you combine and how? You mean the animal styles? Yep. I wouldn't combine anything. You practice a martial art. You internalize it. But if you could, though? I can do anything. I can, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I can do whatever but I want. I'm the kung fu genius. But if you could, though, which ones would you combine and how? Mm. No, it doesn't make sense. Because the way I understand certain animal styles from what I've seen from Maxifu or whatever, um, they are extremely effective the way they're supposed to work. But the way they work is contradictory to some of the other things we do in Wing Chun. So again, I would, mm. I would, I would revert back to what I just said. It would be more about taking the characteristic of, of an animal and applying that to Wing Chun over the superficial techniques. Because it, mm. it, it gives the impression that there's an angle of movement we're somehow missing. And I don't, I don't quite see it that way. Uh, My favorite yeah. animal style is actually uh, In and Out Burger. In and Out Burger. Yeah, they, they they do animal style fries, and they are the nuts. Some secret menu. Good to know. Good to know. All right, what do we got next? All right, next up, we got Shadow Mancer One Hundred and One. 
Shadow Mancer. It's been a while since we had a question yeah, from Shadow man. Mancer. He's back. Mm-hmm. He's back in the fold. Hi, KFG and all the great team. Thank you. I think he means you too back there. Yeah. Mikey. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I was wondering, with your recent surgery, what are the most common injuries you've encountered in Wing Chun? Any recommendations to help prevent future problems? A big love from HK. Uh, well, I, I mean, it all depends because everyone comes to Wing Chun with their own previous injuries, their own issues, their own compensations or whatever. So again, it's very difficult. People like general answers to specific questions. Yeah. All right. And there's really no such thing. Right. So, you know, the, the student that's over six feet tall comes with a whole set of issues versus the other student who's a little bit shorter and has had a year, uh, years and years of athletics behind them, mm. comes with different issues than the student who's never done any athletics before and is starting as an adult. So, so again, it's always like, give me the general answer for the specific question, right? Or a specific answer for a general question. It, it, does, it doesn't really exist. Um, obviously I had rotator cuff surgery uh, about four months ago and rotator cuff is, I wouldn't say it's a common injury in Wing Chun, it's a common injury in athletics. Mm -hmm. The rotator cuff is kind of a poorly designed tendon in terms of the way that it rotates. Our arms don't really like certain planes of movement. It's kind of not necessarily part of our, uh, evolutionary biology, but we're now doing things that maybe we weren't 100% intended to Monkey yet. style of help that shit. Yeah, exactly, right? Uh, and so, but really, what what do you have in martial arts? What's the issue? You have the same, martial arts is not unique in that aim. Any kind of athletic endeavor, whether it's martial arts, sports, uh, physical fitness, training, whatever, what kills you is often the overuse, okay? It's, it's the doing the same thing again and again and again and again and again. In fact, Kenneth J talked about it in the Rocky Four montage oh, review we did, yeah. because they had um, they had Ivan doing these <laughs> external rotations with a crazy amount of weight, yeah. and that's kind of like almost like a rotator cuff rehab exercise. But he's doing it with like brawlic <laughs> amount of weight or whatever, and it's like he's gonna get an overuse injury and muck up his shoulders for an external rotation, which is absolutely mm. not necessary in a boxing, right? So it's like it literally didn't make any sense, right? Punching like this, exactly. Rocky's like, yo, what's you know, up? For, for an MMA fighter might need that kind of rotation because okay. an MMA fighter fighter might need to fight out of a submission. They need to have some kind of odd angle strength because their arms being pinned in a weird mm -hmm. position. So again, it's contextual. We can say that the loading that much external rotation on uh, with weight is stupid for boxing, but it might be a little bit smarter, maybe not with that much weight, but might be smarter for someone who does jujitsu or does something else, right? So the jujits. there are Wing Chun Sifus who've done Wing Chun their entire lives and never had any rotator cuff issues. And there are other ones who had rotator cuff issues and never got them repaired. And there are other ones who had rotator cuff issues like me and got them repaired, right? It's also it's also genetics. It's different for everyone. What tears someone's rotator cuff doesn't even doesn't even begin to get the other person warmed up yet. You know what I mean? Yeah. So so it, it's difficult. Obviously, wow. body mechanics place uh, are, are very important. I mean, my injury, I don't think came from specifically from Wing Chun. Um, my injury probably came between a combination of the jujitsu training. <laughs> So it's not the Wing Chun. Bad guy and, behavior. And playing the bad guy sometimes for my students, right? Because I want my students to learn how to fight against non-Wing Chun style. So I sometimes have to give them like crazy weird windmill punches, uh, you know, wild stuff, grab them in weird angles. And so I feel that I get the most jacked up when I'm playing the bad guy. You know, it's funny. I, I told a Wing Chun Sifu around the time I got the surgery, he's a Wing Chun Sifu from another lineage, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, I got to get rotator cuff repair. You know, it's unfortunately a common injury, you know, in, in, you know, for some Wing Chun people in martial artists. And he was very quick to say, well, in my Wing Chun lineage, we don't have that problem. You know what I mean? And it was kind of, and I realized it's like, oh man. And it reminds me sometimes why I hate having conversations with Wing Chun people. Because sometimes, even in like ones you consider your friends, there's always a little bit, if they're from another lineage, there's yeah. always like a little bit of flexing and posturing or whatever, right? And of course, for me, I'm like, well, I mean, everyone from gymnasts to baseball players to basketball players tear their rotator cuffs. No one goes, basketball is terrible because you can get a rotator cuff. Basketball is terrible because you tear your knees apart, right? Yeah. 
But anything that you're going to pursue seriously has a risk of injury. That's also part of what makes it worthwhile. And also, if you are not, uh, um, you know, if you never have an injury in mm -hmm. whatever your choice of pursuit is, you're either extremely lucky, extremely strong and genetically gifted, or you're not really trying. Mm. Now, I'm not an advocate of like, no pain, no gain. I'm not the guy that says, yo, man, if you have one more rep and your shoulder's about to rip off, just push through it. And if you hear tearing, go ahead and push it. I'm not that guy at all. I'm like all about train smart, train safe, prehab, all the joints you use, flexibility, Shit. ice, all like I'm that guy. And even I got a torn rotator cuff, right? Because I train a lot. All right. And, and so when someone wants to flex and and say, oh, this is the training methods or whatever. First of all, you have no you don't know why I tore my rotator cuff. I barely know why I tore my rotator cuff. Right. Uh, I think it's just a combination of a little bit of overuse and a lot of bad guy behavior. Mm -hmm. But I'm 43 years old and I train martial arts professionally. And I the other day I was looking at my surgery and I'm like, oh, I had right rotator cuff repair. Six years ago, I had my left shoulder done. I've had two inguinal hernia surgeries. Mm. All right. Uh, I had um, heel spurs, two heel spurs. I always get both I sides. That shit. I'm amazing, right? In that way. Yeah. I don't get one shoulder messed up. I get both. <laughs> so I have both my shoulders repaired. Right. I got the inguinal hernia on both sides. Most yeah. people just get one side. No, I get two yeah. because of my OCD and I yeah. need to do it on both sides. Heel spurs, not one heel, both heels, <laughs> both at the same time. I'm always, everything is in tandem, right? Uh, so, you know, for me, it's like I go, wow, I've been doing martial arts and look at all the surgeries I've had. I had these two shoulders, I had two inguinal hernias, and I and, uh, had the, the heel spurs. And then I was watching like, uh, like a, um, one of those videos they make before a big MMA fight where they kind of follow the fighter along there. And this, uh, I think it was TJ Dillashaw who's in his mid-30s. And yeah. they were talking about the number of surgeries he had just in the last two years. And that's on top of the other surgeries that he's had before. And he's had like more surgeries in that time than all those surgeries <laughs> I had in my Wing Chun career. And then so it's all a matter of perspective. Right. Most Wing Chun people, if they teach, uh, they're still kind of hobbyists. Yeah, you teach a Wing Chun class two, three times a week. You do a little bit of chi sao, and then you see, oh, that guy gets injured. Oh, in my Wing Chun style, we don't get injured. Dude, you know what my training schedule is. You know that I'm here teaching in the morning. I'm teaching in the evening. I'm teaching at night. I get in there with my students. I'm grabbing them. On top of that, I train with you. I train with Craig, not just in Wing Chun, but also, all right, let's let's put the gloves on and go back and forth and let's experiment with these things. Or I'm doing jujitsu or, uh, you know, I'm doing strength training or whatever. So I'm not standing there doing the Sunam Tao once a day, <laughs> doing some very light Poon Sao and correcting my students, right? So it's easy when people don't really train that hard, right? And I'm not an advocate of go out there and injure yourself. But I'm also not an advocate of the fact that you do Wing Chun means you can just kind of be lazy and stand there. It's like you you want to you want to improve the reputation for Wing Chun. Man, sweat a little bit. Yeah. Try hard, you know? And so I think, you know, to have had six surgeries in my entire ad lucky. adult Wing Chun career. Oh, shit, you, yeah. As you much know? as you train, you should, yeah. Yeah, it's okay. and, and also these are things, yeah, I mean, maybe it's more than other people, but I'm also like, oh, the moment this happens, I get it taken care of. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, they're famous Wing Chun Sifus from lineages that have told me that they never have shoulder problems that have completely torn shoulders and they just don't get it fixed. Because in Chinese Kung Fu, there's an element of health, right? So the internal stuff. So the idea is that, you know, we can heal ourselves through qigong and breathing and restorative practices. And I actually believe it. I do a lot of restorative practices. To, that's why I can still go as much as I can at age 43. But even then, you cannot solve everything through qigong and restorative breathing. Sometimes your tendons just rip mm. because you train them really hard or you make a mistake or something, right? And for Chinese Kung Fu people, because there is this especially, there's this air of like, I can heal myself all the time. I will tell you, as someone who spent a lot of time in Hong Kong and a lot of time with famous Kung Fu masters, out, Wing Chun, even outside of my lineage, I cannot tell you how many of them have torn shoulders, torn this, torn that, and they don't get it fixed because it's an admission that they weren't able to heal themselves. Mm. So it's out of stubbornness. Wow. And that's ridiculous. Your shoulder tears, get the thing fixed. 
go to rehab. Rehab's not good enough. Get the surgery, get it fixed, fix it, go back to trainings. You don't want to be 80 years old with a 40 year old tear in your mm. shoulder, right? Get it fixed. Anyway, next question. Damn, homie. 80 years old with a 40 year old tear. Yeah. All right, next question. We got Dryzen. He's asking hypothetical. A hypothetical Dryzen question. <laughs> You know, it was funny. I went over to look at Mikey Dean because it's a Dreisen question. <laughs> he's dead asleep. He's dead asleep. <laughs> because every time we get a Dreisen question, it's like, oh, man, one of these. I look over at Mikey Dean. He's there with the headphones on like this. <laughs> we, we both looked at it. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, what's I happening hope that's not a, uh, I hope that's not like a precursor of the, the, re the reception of this episode. Man. <laughs> Episode 32 was a real yeah. snooze fest, or 33, or whatever we're in right now. <laughs> so, uh, Dreisen asked, uh, hypothetical. Did he axe? He axed that shit. Okay. He he cut it. that shit in. Cut it in. Cut it in. Cut it in. Cut, cut it, it in. <laughs> You're on your way home from the school driving through the Midtown Tunnel. Okay. You come out of the tunnel and notice... You're on a highway in 1970 or so. Wow, these this hypotheticals are always like you're on a bus, you're on a train. I don't know. You get there. Why is it always the 70s as well? I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I haven't finished. But uh, you start freaking out. I notice right, I, I notice right away, it's, is it the 70s in New York or is it the 70s somewhere else? I didn't get to that part yet. Oh, okay. You start freaking out and you crash. Sounds not you like You crash that. into a red Mercedes-Benz 350SL, and the guy gets out in a rage. This guy in a rage is Bruce Lee, and ah. he's coming at your car. Okay. Pretty hot. So I, he, I hit his famous, his, his famous SL. Mercedes. And he kicks your door. Okay. What the fuck, man? Man. Our, our new, I, our new dude, editor. Dude, that's what it says. Yeah, but, but somehow he reads it and he's got emotion in it, right? He never has this level of emotion no, with anyone else's that's question. That's what it says here in yeah. question. But, but he's getting better at pretending he needs to read the question to know what's going on. Because yeah. I keep asking him, in past episodes, he somehow knew all that stuff off the top but of his head. right here. Yeah. It's right here. <laughs> yeah, I'm it's reading. Like, oh, yeah, I haven't got seen it. it before. Anyway, got he, it. he curses Dreisen. at you, he kicks the car, and he's like, get out. Get out. You crashed my car. Uh -huh. Get out. Uh-huh. It's Bruce Lee. Yeah. You see clearly that it's him. It's yes. not like a Bruce Lie or a Bruce Lay uh -huh, uh -huh. or a Bruce Lee. Or Bru Bru Bruce Dre. <laughs> Bruce Dre. <laughs> Bruce, Bruce Dre. Dre. Okay. What do you do? So, okay, so I've gone through the Midtown Tunnel. I've gone through some kind of time vortex on the other side of the... I thought you were going to have a Men in Black question. Cause remember the first Men in Black? They go through the Midtown Tunnel and they're driving upside down and everything like that, right? Um, and notice how we say, I thought when you asked... <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, no, no it's not. It's no, no, I get it. 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 I Dreisen asked it. Dreisen yeah, gets it. So she did. Yeah. So uh, and then so I'm on the other side. It's the '70s. I hit Bruce Lee's famous cherry red uh, Mercedes SL. He comes out. He gets pissed off. He kicks my door. What do I do? Kicks your car door. Kicks my car. Yeah. Well, obviously, what other door is he gonna kick? <laughs> my house door. You told me I was in my car. I like how you need to clarify that. Your car door, okay? <laughs> right. Good. Thanks. Thanks. Well, what would I do? What would I do without this guy here? <laughs> Clarify that for me. Okay. He's yeah. Rage, so, so he's like man. pissed off. He's, you know, he's raging. Right. Like cocaine rage. Cocaine rage. Okay. That that was also written in the question, right? It's yeah. Right here. Yeah, yeah. It's right there. It's right there. Because I, 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 I was gonna say the whole thing seems a bit weird. Like I can't really see Bruce Lee kind of just getting into a. <laughs> a big rage, right? So you had to like kind of, sorry, not you, kind of add it in. It was obviously in the question. You just misread it, right? Right. I right. just no, right. yeah, it's right noticed it now. Yeah, although I uh, mean, uh, Bruce Lee purportedly had like a very bad temper, so it's it's actually possible that this 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 situation very well could have happened. All right. First of all, I would say, hey, Bruce, man, and he'd be like. I know who he is, right? <laughs> Take it easy, man. Your car's already dinged up. When Raymond gave that thing to you, that thing was already totally messed up anyway. So people don't realize that. Throw the Raymond card at yeah. him. Yeah, throw the Raymond card at him. As if that's going to make him happier, right? Because what people don't realize about Bruce Lee's SL is that was a hand-me-down from Raymond oh, Chow. God. Because 
like the way I look at it, Bruce Lee and Raymond Chow had a little bit of like a Suge Knight, Tupac kind of thing going on. Right. <laughs> where Raymond's kind of holding the money bag, and when Bruce complains a little bit about not getting paid, he throws a couple little bucks at him yeah. or whatever to keep him quiet, but he's kind of holding the bag, right? And so to give Bruce this air of being a movie star, he gave him his Mercedes SL. That's why if you look at the photos, especially when you look at some of the better color photos of Bruce in front of the SL, like... Um, in front of Golden Harvest Studios, and then the other one on top of Harbor City. Remember, I took you there. Yeah. The famous uh, parking lot that's on uh, oh, with now where the Harbor dope. City Mall is. Hicks. And yeah, so yeah. for anyone who has ever come to Hong Kong with me, if you want to stand in those spots where Bruce Lee stood, yeah. uh, I took I took this guy there, and we put you right in the same exact spots where Bruce same Lee poses. stood. Same right? poses. Same poses. <clears> took those photos. Um, if you actually look at Bruce Lee's red SL. Mm -hmm. You will see that thing is dinged up. <laughs> All right. Now, Bruce apparently from was you, also from you crashing. Well, uh, Bruce apparently was a crappy driver from <laughs> all accounts. Um, even Chuck Norris talked about it. Remember, Bruce had bought a Porsche when he was like dead broke and he just drove it like a maniac and, and apparently like, up on curbs and stuff like that, um, which is funny because actually I heard the same exact thing about my Seagong Leung Ting. The late Sifu Elman Leung once told me a story that he rented, uh, um, that he was in LA with Sifu <laughs> Leung Ting in the 80s. Bad driver. Bad driver, bad driver. Well, first of all, first of all, because Sifu Leung Ting would have, so wild. because Sifu Leung Ting would have the same problem that my wife has. My wife is from Hong Kong, which okay. is that they drive like this guy here on the wrong side of the road. It's such a poor excuse. Like, it's not a poor oh. excuse. Use. It's the truth. You guys drive on the wrong side of the road. Hong Kong is the, the in the old British way. It's but on the I, wrong I, side I of the road. Just like to point out though that it's, when you drive on the right side of the road, the correct side of the road, shall we say, the correct side of the road, the left, the rest of the world. Yeah. Is oh wait, wrong. The, when you drive on the right side of the road, the, the right side. The correct. The, side. The, oh, the, the, the correct, correct side, meaning meaning the, the right left. side. Got it's it. Got the it. Left, right. Got it. So then, when we would vacation in I don't know anywhere in Europe, we'd then have to drive on the right with our steering wheel. On the opposite side of yes. the car, which makes us automatically better drivers than everybody else. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 sure, sure. You know what's interesting, kind of on that same point there? Uh, mainland China is on the right side of the road like here in America, but Hong Kong is on the left side. So when you cross the border from Hong Kong into China, like if you go from oh, Hong Kong into indeed. Shenzhen, yeah. So basically, it's so crazy because when you come in, you're on the left side because you're Hong Kong, in, so the traffic is going this way. Hong Kong going in and, and coming into Hong Kong. And then the the street goes up and then it literally crosses over. And then you are now on the right side. But if you're from Hong Kong, you got the steering wheel on the other side. Wheel. And you have to have the two plates and stuff. So that's like some oh. legit stuff. Anyways, the late Sibu yeah. Elman Leung told me a story that he was in Los Angeles with Sibu Leung Ting, like in the 80s or 90s. And Sibu Leung Ting rented a car for some reason, which is crazy. I don't know why he would rent a car. And he drove it. And it was like a manual, and he wasn't really good at driving a manual. And he said, he said, Sifu Leung Ting was driving up on the curb, and he would always turn to the wrong side of the road. And, stuff like that. and I'm just like, oh my God, that would make such a great skit, right? So I can imagine Bruce Lee was, you know, uh, most likely learned how to drive in the States, and then now he has to go to Hong Kong and drive on the other side of the road, right? So he probably had some of those issues. Um, from what I understood, the car was kind of dinged up when he gave it to Bruce, but I think Bruce also kind of dinged it up too. So I'd probably say, hey man, look at your car. It was already dinged up when Raymond gave it to you. What are you so upset about? And second of all, I'm glad you didn't make Silent Flute. That thing would have been a serious turkey. And you better actually write a script for Game of Death. Otherwise, that thing is going nowhere. You see what I mean? Like the Tang Sang thing. You just tell him a couple super insider things that are like going on in his mind. <laughs> right? And then he's like, who is this guy? He would be way too discombobulated. Right? And I'd be, okay. look, man. You are the king of Kung Fu. All right? Don't mess around with B-list actresses, man. Come on. It'll be the death of you. That's all I'll say. All right? Don't mess around with Taiwanese so B-list actresses. you won't get out of the car and fight them. You just fight them. No, no, no. I would use the art of fighting without fighting, uh, right? Okay? <laughs> I would say, like, yo, man, you know, forget Silent Flute, man. That thing was kind of a... Let's, let, you know, you, you let James Colburn do that, man. Forget about it, right? Don't, that, that's not your movie. Forget about yeah. Game of Death. You really need to write a script. Don't just come up with those three fight scenes because that's not gonna that's not gonna cut the mustard. You need to actually write a story first before you come up with those things, right? Wow. And you know, be a little bit wary of Raymond, but I don't think Shaw's is a good way to go. I would tell him all these things. These are all the things that are in his head, right? And wow. the whole like, dude, don't mess around with Taiwanese B level actresses, man. They'll kill you. No, Dryson right. was actually a bit upset there. That, well, I'm guessing, I don't know, he's not in the room with us, that he was really just aiming to see if you were going to fight him. 
Yeah, I know, but you see. Yeah, that's what I'm. That's what I'm reading here. But see, but see, Dryson. Sorry, Dre. I am now. I am now, forty three years old. Yeah. If you had asked me that question when I was twenty four, I'd be like, ah, let me see if I can match with Bruce Lee. No, I'm like, yo, let me mess with his. And he'd be like, what? Right, right. And then I'd be like, and look, man, you should tell Bob Baker to burn those letters. (laughs) <laughs> because by the time he's got the SL, he's already been getting stuff from Baker for a few right. years now, right? And he'd be like, tell Bob Baker to burn those letters. And he'd be like, what? And then he would look at me, and I would look at him. And you know what he would say to me? What? Did we just become best friends? <laughs> Step brothers? Yes. I, I am your oracle, Bruce. I can see your future. You see that tunnel? On the other side of the tunnel, that was 2021. Yeah. I came in here, I'm here. This is why I'm here. Let me financial plan for you, and as then, Russell Peters said. <laughs> and then we'll have an 80s Bruce Lee. And then we have an 80s Bruce Lee. Yes. In a video with Michael Jackson, yes. Is that he, in a video with two life crew, please? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You know, if you change one thing in the past, a lot of things in the future change. If yeah. Bruce Lee never died, there would be no two life crew. Don't ask me why. Yeah. It just would be the case. Yeah. Oh, no, they would there be wouldn't be any Doodle <laughs> Brown. No Doodle <laughs> Brown. All right. So what else we got? Well, Dryzen had a follow up. Well, Unbelievable. Follow up. Wow. Okay, go ahead. Would you keep the dent or would you get it fixed? Oh, would I like to say, oh, this, this dent <laughs> inside was given by Bruce Lee, right? Right. Just like on, on my uh, wooden dummy over here when Sifa Lungton got right. mad at me when I did the mistake yeah. on the seventh set of the dummy. <laughs> and he kicked the living crap out of the dummy with his shoes and left the mark. So and legit, I just leave it there. That mark dent. right there. Right. So when you guys do the cross step from the seventh set of the wooden dummy, you know exactly where to kick because the old man got so mad at me, kicked the thing a bunch of times and literally left his mark on the dummy, right? Yeah, of course. And I will like, maybe I need to spray it or shellac it so that it stays there, right? So it doesn't Great. fade over the years. Right? That's great. Uh, no, man, I wouldn't. You know why? Because I'm, I'm, I'm very OCD about my car. Mm. I don't like dents or scratches or anything like that. I'd get it fixed, even if Bruce Lee gave it wow. to me. Wow. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Damn. Or I would sell the car to a Bruce Lee collector, collector. and then get a new one. But I cannot drive a car with a dent in the, <laughs> wall, in the door. No, I can't do that. I can't do that. So great. Yeah. I love Dryson's questions, man. He sure he's, do, he's, good. Yeah, he's, he's good. Really he do, comes yeah. with some good questions. Yeah, he sure does like that. Yeah, right? he loves it. <laughs> hey, Kung Fu Genius listeners. Are you a fan of Wing Chun Kung Fu? Well, if you listen to me, I assume you are. I got great news for KFG fans. Right now, you can get an all-access, one-month free trial subscription to Wing Chun Illustrated Magazine. Yes, I said free. Go to WCINewsstand.com and register in the upper right-hand corner. Fill out your email and password and use the code KFG Trial to get your free trial to all the issues from 2011 to the current issue. That's right, all the issues. Even the one with this cool guy on the cover. That's me for those of you listening to us on audio. My Kung Fu Genius column is also in all the new issues as if you needed another reason to get this awesome magazine. Go get your free trial subscription today. For all that information, check out the description below. And now back to me. Oh, all right. Next up, we got J.P. Steve's Hand in Hand. Hand in Hand. Okay, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> All right, go for it. It's literally what it says yes. here. Hey, KF- K- 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 hey, KFG. No, you can edit that this out way in you post. Can, this is, no, don't edit that, Andrew. Don't edit yeah, that. Do not edit Let that. him die on that hill <laughs> so that people can see that the Dreisen questions, he says flawlessly, <laughs> barely looking at them, but any other question he can't do. Can't, All right, let's go. Let's go. Can't even read KFG. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go. All right. Hey, KFG. Yo. What is your straight up opinion on Bruce Lee as a fighter? By that I mean, by that I mean is do you believe that he could actually fight for real? Because from what I've seen around these parts. Around these parts. Parts that, meaning YouTube comments. That argument usually goes on opposite ends of the spectrum. Some claim he was just an actor who knew nothing about real fighting, Mm. while others believe he was some sort of demigod who could never lose a fight. I personally stand somewhere in between. Not me. Yeah, I know. I know you are. J.P. You're invoking the spirit of J.P. Smith, the Hannah, 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 right? Yeah. Got it. So, uh, yeah, this is kind of the con- like one of the things that I didn't realize when I started to do the KFG podcast was that, you know, how much of this like kind of Bruce Lee 
um, the, the, how much this conversation is so prevalent because it's the conversation on both ends of the spectrum, in my opinion, are done for like people who believe he was an unstoppable, invincible human being, which is ridiculous because even he didn't look at himself that way. These are like this super delusion. I mean, that's dudes. why he put so much work in. Yeah. You're the people who believe <clears throat> that he is like unbeatable and undefeatable, in my opinion, are just as ignorant of what Bruce Lee was about as the people who are like, oh, that guy couldn't do anything. He was just an actor. Well, he acted as a child, all right? He was a childhood actor. He did about 20 movies when he was a kid. And he did about three, three and a half movies as an adult. <laughs> three, okay? three and a half. And, yeah. half. Yeah, right? Uh, yeah, because so yeah, right? Game of Death was kind of... Kind of has, like a well, half. He did four movies, really. Oh, Let's right, just say right. he did four movies, right? In the last two and a half years of his life. And for 12 years in the States, he, with the exception of the short time that he was um, working on the Green Hornet for one season... He was working as a martial arts instructor. Yeah. So for 12 years of his life, he was actually a martial arts instructor. And he was training, uh, you know, with, with people who are former boxers, former judoka, former karate instructors. He had the respect of a lot of the high-level martial art guys at that time. Even if 30, 40 years later, suddenly Chuck Norris and all these guys, oh, yeah, maybe he would, uh, whatever. Like, yeah, you weren't saying that shit when he was around, right? In fact, Bruce, Bruce, Bruce uh, sorry, Chuck got a little lippy about, you know, what Bruce was or whatever and had to write a letter of apology to Bruce Lee while Bruce Lee was around, right? So when Bruce Lee was around, when Chuck was talking ish, he had to write a letter to Bruce to apologize, all right? Now Bruce has been dead for After forty-eight Bruce years. Gave him that call. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Now, now cursing him out. Now uh, Bruce has been dead for forty-eight years, and suddenly everyone's recollection gets better, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like the oh, uh, I, I think I know what you're about. To yeah, talk you know about. what I mean. So, so that that that's one of the things. But for the most part, the <clears> martial <throat> artists who existed at that time, the high-level guys, the Ed Parkers and so on, had like a relatively high opinion of Bruce There's Lee. There's a karate guy that said he he actually... Uh... Yeah, Victor Moore. Uh, Vic Moore, yeah. But he's full of shit. And you can <laughs> see the video of him not able to stop Bruce Lee's punch. And he kind of has to bow embarrassingly. And now in his mind, he grabbed Bruce Lee's punch. I don't know if yeah. defeated out of, him. Out of thin in, air. Yeah, I mean, like, shit. you know, it's... Because the camera literally yeah, I mean, it's nonsense. shows it. It's nonsense. And let's say, and let, look, Bruce is just doing a demonstration to show how quick he is. Right? Let's say he stopped one of us. So what? Yeah. All right? So you think you're actually better than him? Oh. Who the hell is talking about Vic Moore? No one. Vic Moore is talking about Vic Moore. By the way, he calls himself a grandmaster, which is always suspicious. All right. <laughs> grandmaster, the head of what's, what style are you the head? What style of karate or whatever are you the head of? Oh. Tell me. So anyway. The delusional fanboys are people who believe that Bruce Lee in real life was some variation of the characters he played in his movies. And they're also usually the people who don't really understand martial arts from practice because there's, no one is invincible, no, is, no one is unstoppable, and uh, no one is unbeatable. I mean, this is ridiculous, right? The most unbeatable fighter could be sucker punched by someone half his weight and get knocked out in the middle of the day. Okay, <laughs> I mean, like, so, I mean, this is really, really stupid, right? And so... Uh, but the other people who think, oh, he was just an actor because they only know him from movies, like he was a martial arts instructor for 12 years and trained with a lot of different guys, taught a lot of guys, and many of his students are extremely skillful. I mean, look at the late Jesse Glover. I mean, these are very skillful dudes. Look at Dan and Asanto. Look at all these. These are skillful dudes. Mm -hmm. And they learn from Bruce Lee, okay? So to say this, it's, it's kind of ignorant on both ends. He, he, was, he was both an actual martial artist who understood martial arts from a realistic standpoint and he was also an actor he was not unbeatable and he was not someone who didn't understand about fighting either and the problem is that many people have a difficult time understanding that a few different things can be true at the same time you know he could have had uh, positive fighting experiences positive meaning like fights that he won situations that he did well in um, because, you know, he was quite good at what he did. And also maybe he never met someone who put him in a position where he was in trouble. So, so much of what happens in our lives are just accidents of fate or accidents of happenstance. He's like, it is what it is, right? Okay. Uh, a fighter's ascension, <clears throat> he's undefeated because he only fought people or she only fought people that they were able to beat, right? Look at Lo Ronda Rousey mm -hmm. in her ascension, right? Had she met, you know, when she didn't lose until she fought Holly Holm, 
Had she met Holly Holm four years earlier, she could have lost four years earlier. So, I mean, the, the thing is that it, it, it is all, it, it's all how things play out. Bruce had a handful of fights that we know about. Uh, of course, people are like, oh, yeah, well, I haven't seen it on video. Yeah, because as I like to remind people, the, the, <laughs> cell, the cell phone cameras in, in, in 1960, the iPhone camera in 1964 had potato level quality. <laughs> All right, it was terrible. All right, people don't realize that because they think of their fancy phones now. The iPhones right, right. in the '60s were not as good as the ones you have. People don't realize that. Yeah, yeah. You had to like crank the thing to get it started or whatever. Usually, yeah. by the time you got it cranked and ready to go, the fight was over. Right? It was way over. So it's like people, yeah, I didn't see him, but who, who are you watching fight in the '60s? That's not in a movie, or in a point fighting, or in boxing. All right, or, or the rare video of Helio Gracie or something having having a challenge fight or something like that. Right? This is still very rare for that time, regardless of who you were, right? Yeah. So people are using like the, the 2020 lens or 2021 lens to say, oh, I didn't see this or whatever. Yeah, also, you know, Bobo Sauce 26 who's commenting on my YouTube, also never saw you fight either, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so uh, I, I just find it's kind of a tiresome argument because until I got into like YouTubing and seeing what all the people write about, like the comments we get, because we get both. Hey, Bruce, you're just an actor. You didn't know anything. Great. All right. And like, it doesn't bother me that you think that. It's a bit ignorant of his what happened in his life, but whatever. You're an ignorant person, Bubble Sauce 25. Um, you know, with the a avatar of like, you know, the, the, you know, a, a chicken or something like that. We're like, 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 why do I need to care what you say? All right. I'm laughing because there's probably a dude with that same. One hundred percent. First of all, the avatar isn't a chicken. <laughs> What is it, a cop? Now we know who it is. It's a cop. <laughs> and so, uh, man, Andrew, Andrew's going to have to Andrew's gonna have to work hard bleeping everything out of this episode. <laughs> you know, but then, then there's someone else who commented the other day. It was like, Bruce Lee could beat anyone in the blink of an eye. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. All right? But the thing is, the fact that I don't think that that's the truth literally doesn't diminish Bruce Lee at all in my mind. Okay? Not not one bit, because like like you know for me the same way you could look at Anderson Silva's tremendous career and not be like Yo, Anderson Silva could stop anyone in the book. No, you have to look at the sum of what 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 the person has done over time, and you're gonna find very few people who've done as much as Bruce Lee did in 32 years in all the different fields that he did it in. And nowadays you got all these armchair idiots going, yeah, he wasn't this, he wasn't it, dude. Show me your fight reel, all right? I want to see what you've done, okay? <laughs> And so uh, I, I don't I don't think it's that relevant because one of the one of the things I think people don't realize is uh, it's very important to draw inspiration from something and that inspiration doesn't have to be the answer to everything. It just has to be something that gives you a little bit of an extra kick. That's enough. That thing that inspires you doesn't need to be the end all be all. It just needs to give you a kick. I'll always remember Sivo Heinrich Pfaff. My, one of my instructors in Germany. One of the last things he said to me before I left the castle, which I didn't quite understand it then, mm. uh, is he, he told me before I left, he goes, uh, because I was about to go to the States and start teaching, right? And he said, the most important thing for an instructor is inspiration. And I remember thinking like, I wasn't 100% sure what that meant. But then I came back to the States, I opened my school, and for the first few years, you're so busy teaching the students and getting things going, right? And then you do it for three, four, five years, you start to establish yourself a little bit, and then you realize when the students come in to learn, they're looking at you. You are like almost like a battery, and you are providing this power to them. They see you, 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 you demo something, you show them something, you, 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 know, you make them laugh, you show them like what they can do with Wing Chun, you, you, you stick hands with them, you make them feel what is possible, what they're able to learn, what they're gonna learn, the different levels and stuff like that. And you realize at some point, they're all coming to you and they're taking from your inspiration battery, all right? Not from your life energy battery, but your inspiration battery. And you need to recharge that yourself. Mm -hmm. Because when you're the guy that they're looking at, who, who do you look to to bring yourself up to the level that the students are looking at you and they're, hopefully you are raising their level and their mood and all that kind of stuff, right? And that's when I realized what Sivo Heinrich had told me. Because at some point, you're the guy that people are looking at when you're teaching. And that doesn't mean that you're an endless source of, that you're endlessly self-inspired, 
right? So I realized that after a while. Now, how did I keep inspired? Well, I continue to train. For me, I can I'm consider myself always a student of martial arts, it, whether it's Wing Chun or learning about other things or training methods or talking to Dr. Kenneth Jay and finding out more about sports physiology. Like you have to keep learning and improving and looking at better ways of doing stuff. And you even sometimes need to learn things that are not in your wheelhouse. Maybe you're not going to apply it one to one, but this collective knowledge makes you better as an instructor, better as a martial artist, and it gives you more background and stories and things you can tell the students to explain things from different angles. And Bruce Lee has been, especially since I've been teaching, you know, a tremendous source of inspiration because I'll look at him and I'll see what he accomplished and I'll see these notes and the way he thought and the way he was always working. And it makes me feel like uh, I'm not doing enough. But not in a, in a way where I feel negative about it. Mm. In a way like, I can do more. Mm. I, can, I can do more. I can do it, right? Because look at what he was doing. Look at his schedule. Look at what he's doing. And not that everything about the way Bruce Lee lived his life is necessarily the model we want. We can take cautionary lessons about overworking and burning the candle at both ends, apply that to our lives. But when you look at him and you look at his body and, what his, and, his, and his body of work and what he did and stuff, you can't help but feel... At least for me, like I get goosebumps and I feel tingly. That might be somebody else for someone else. But that's when I really understood what Sifo Heinrich told me about the most important thing for an instructor is inspiration. I didn't know it first because I didn't realize after a while, everyone is looking at you, your students look at you like this, right? And you need someone to look at like that mm. so you can kind of pass that along, you know? All right. So <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> so thank you for that, uh, JP Steve's hand in hand in hand. <laughs> hand, in hand. <laughs> Appreciate that question. Next up, we got Michael J. Fox. I mean, what? Martin. Michael J. Martin. <laughs> wow. Yes. I mean, I read, we got Michael. I, read it. I Michael, misread it. Yeah. I misread Michael it. Jackson. Oh, sorry. Sorry. We got a t a t a Tito Puentes. Tito Puentes. Tito Puente. King. Hi, Alex. I enjoy the show. Happy to hear. I teach Tai Chi and Bakwa Zhang. And I currently have a student who has trained Wing Chun before. He has shown me a few things from Wing Chun. I was surprised at how close the concepts were to what I teach. I was wondering if you ever considered training an internal art such as Tai Chi or Bakwa to gain a different perspective on Wing Chun. That's a great question. It actually rolls very nicely with the last answer about inspiration, right? So mm. obviously I teach Wing Chun. That's what people come to me for. It doesn't make sense for me to mix a bunch of random things and sell that or pawn that off as Wing Chun. Um, but as an instructor, you need to be inspired. You need to look and see what other people are doing. I've been very lucky here uh, because uh, we've had uh, uh, people come here and teach seminars. Like they use my space to teach a seminar or sometimes to teach a special class or whatever. So I've had very high level Tai Chi people and high level Bagua people and people from internal martial arts literally come to City Wing Chun and teach a seminar. And I've had the chance to talk to these guys and, and, and you know, have Still. a little bit of a back and forth and stuff. And so... Certainly, Bagua, I find that there's a lot of, even from a technical perspective, there's some things that are very similar to Wing Chun. I mean, I think at the root of it, you will find a lot of similarities between many of the Chinese martial arts. Um, even though the northern styles are kind of within the realm of Chinese martial arts are culturally different than the southern martial arts, but you still see some parallels in some northern styles to southern styles. And of course, that might be in the more modern cross-pollination of those styles. I don't know if it was that way 100 years ago. They might have been more distinct and more separate at that time. But, you know, if you go and, uh, you know, practice with someone who's like uh, from Southern Mantis, Zhao Ga Tong Long, you'll certainly see crossover to Wing Chun. Uh, same thing with Mak Sifu. When you look at certain ideas in Hong Kun, you yeah. see parallels to Wing Chun. When I see some some really good Tai Chi guys who have really good with push hands, even though the stance and the concept might be uh, 
physically might look a little bit different, but obviously you see the same ideas. I mean, what are we trying to do? We're trying to stop someone from hitting us, right? So obviously there are going to be things that are similar, right? And same with Bagua. And so obviously, you know, there are, there's a lot of crossover. Now, the crossover could be because a lot of traditional Chinese martial arts have the same root. Some people think they all come from the same place, but to think that a country as large as China, which has a martial arts history that predates the Shaolin Temple by a long mile, uh, to then think that all Chinese martial arts come from Shaolin when we actually, there's evidence of Chinese martial arts existing that predate the Shaolin Temple. So mm -hmm. this, this, this tired trope that all Chinese martial arts and all martial arts all over the world came from the Shaolin Temple that, that needs to die a violent death because it's not true. It's simply not true. But certain groupings of martial arts probably have similar ancestry. And also the other thing that I, that I think people don't take into consideration as much is in the modern era of Chinese martial arts, well, how many people who did Bagua have also practiced Wing Chun or how many people who did some Hong Kun later 16. went, you know, later went and did Southern Mantis <laughs> or or how many people who did Choi Lei Fat also did some other Chinese martial art like uh, Shui Jiao or wrestling or something like that. So some of that cross pollination in terms of the concepts and ideas might be because many modern practitioners have in fact trained in more than one Chinese martial art. So it could be the fact that those things existed for a long time because there's a common ancestry. It could be that those things existed because we're all trying to stop someone from punch us in, punching us in the face. So different people come up with similar things, right? Everywhere I go. I'm yeah. So if you if you look at if, if you look at a, my, original, I mean, look at every day. If you look at the original boxing, you know the old like Queensbury rules, and you look at like the very old kind yeah. of English style boxing you see parallels to Chinese martial arts in there. When you look at European quarterstaff fighting, some of it looks like it's straight out of the Lokdim Bunguan manual, right? When you look at uh, Greek pancration, you see all sorts of stuff that are from Asi Asian grappling arts, from Asian striking arts, from Western boxing, the use of a vertical fist. Mm -hmm. You see that in, 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 in Greek pancration. You see vertical fist with the head back and everything like that. So... Sometimes I think people marvel at these things, but I think it's a lot more normal. I think it occurs a lot more normal than that normally than people think, because you know different cultures around the world are trying to stop someone from punching and kicking and gra grabbing them. So naturally, they're going to come up with some similar things. Okay. So you have that might be a reason why there's similarities. Another thing might be they might share a common ancestor somewhere here or a group or whatever. And the other one that I think is not looked at as much is. A lot of more modern Chinese martial arts practitioners have practiced more martial arts, more Chinese martial arts than just the one they're famous for. So you may have someone who did Bagua and had some Wing Chun experience, saw something in Bagua that was similar to their previous Wing Chun experience, and then accentuated that in their Bagua training. Okay. Or you might have someone who did Wing Chun who came from a Bagua background saw certain things, accentuated that in their Wing Chun training, and then some Wing Chun person sees that and bugs hey, look at the similarity. So it's very difficult to tell. I mean, there are people who will tell you, no, 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 it's because of this, this, and this. There are people who are very high in confidence, but low on evidence as to why they feel that way. Hmm. You cannot say for certain why these similarities exist. I think those three reasons I gave are pretty reasonable in terms of why you're going to see crossover stuff. Um, so there's certainly that. Um, but for that reason, I don't think, well, because another martial art shares some similar ideas to mine, I need to study that. Mm, okay. Instead, what I think is while that martial art shares some similar ideas to mine, those things that we share in common might be the ones that are part of the universal truths of martial arts. The things that all martial arts have in common, like we all have our things that are different and we like to talk about what makes us special. But the things that are common, like even when I train with Magno and we do some jujitsu stuff and I look at certain transitions, it's like exactly like what we do in Wing Chun or an idea might be the same, even if the technique is totally different. And those are the things you want to collect and go, these are the common denominators where the Venn diagram overlaps yeah. in all the styles that that's what you're looking for. Because that is the ultimate truth, and everything else is just a different branch on that, that, that tree that comes from the same place. But that doesn't mean now because I found a similarity in Bagua or Tai Chi, oh, now I need to go and do that. I just go, no, no, look, these are things that we both share in common, 
and maybe they have an idea about how to do it and I can think about it if that makes sense mm -hmm. to apply it in a Tai Chi way. I think Tai Chi is really good at, you know, the push hands. And if you deal with a really high level Tai Chi person um, or a high level Bagua person, um, you can really feel like those guys are difficult to move. They can push and pull and all those kind of things. But that is also my complaint about that. And I've talked about this before on Dudes, and I've definitely talked about it on this podcast. And it's not to cast any of those guys in any light, because high-level Tai Chi guys, high-level Bagua guys are extremely skillful. But for me, it's like if you look at martial arts like a pie, all right? And then you look at different things, striking and grappling, and you look at those as different slices of the pie. Mm -hmm. Different martial arts have, they emphasize more of others or whatever. But let's say we're looking at a pie of the transferable skills you need in fighting. And you might have de-escalation, you might have striking, kicking, grappling, surprise attacks, uh, getting out of pins. You might have all these different kinds of things and then you might have contact reflexes, clinching, feeling, sensitivity or whatever. I feel that the, a lot of the Tai Chi and Bagua guys are really, really, really good at an extremely narrow sliver of that pie. Like, if you are going to put your hands on the arms of a Tai Chi guy or on the body of a Tai Chi guy and try to push them and, you know, and they're not going to let you push them. They're going to, you know, dissipate power and move you and use spiraling and rooting and all these kind of things. Like, you could be like, wow, that's super, super impressive. Okay. But what you're doing is you're partaking in their game. They're yeah. very, very specific game. And that's where they're an expert. And it's like you're going into their waters and they're the shark. Yeah. But when you step back and you look at the entire pie, well, if I know this person is really difficult to push and I know this person, I cannot pull them, I can't push them, I can't grab them because they're just so rooted and have all this great internal energy, well, then I'll probably try to box their face off and kick them in the kneecaps, right? Or I might try to go in and, and grapple right. them. I'm just saying in general as a martial artist, I'm not saying as a Wing Chun person. Yeah, you have more options to fight someone who's really, 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 really good at this one sliver than engaging them in the one thing that they're good at. So my issue with some of the internal styles is that they train so much of that at the expense of all the other things we need to worry about someone putting you in different holes, punches and kicks coming at you from a competent boxer or striker, high kicks, all these kind of things. You need to put these all together. By the way, I have the same complaint about Wing Chun people. This yeah. is not to put any kind of Tai Chi or Bagua people on blast. The number of Wing Chun schools that literally only do Chi Sao and never practice how to defend a punch or a takedown or a kick or whatever drives me absolutely nuts. <laughs> if you look at most Wing Chun schools and if you were a space alien coming to this world and you observed most of the Wing Chun training done in most Wing Chun schools, you would assume that this is a style designed to do chi sao with other people. You would, you would maybe not assume that this is actually a style for self-defense or fighting because they have, gotcha. they have made Chi Sao the god and the end-all be-all at the expense of, all right, let's put on gloves. I'm going to fire punches at you. I'm going to try to grab you. I'm going to hold your arms. I'm going to throw kicks at you. And you need to be put together all those skills. And Chi Sao is a part of that when you're in contact. But what happens when we don't have contact? Then I try to box your face off. OK, so, so that's my only issue. And so when I look to inspiration. And I look and I see that Tai Chi guy shows me how he spirals his stance and moves. I go, wow, that's really cool. And I think about whether I can apply those ideas. Do they fit? Are they necessary? Mm -hmm. But that gives me inspiration because now I know a little bit about how the Tai Chi guy does it or the Bagua person does it. And I have studied those things to a certain degree. And I've looked to see what's transferable and what's applicable. But day in and day out, the older I get, the more I go, that stuff is really, really cool, and that stuff satisfies my kung fu geek brain. But the students need to learn how to deal with someone who's going to punch, kick, and try to throw them on the ground and pound their face in with elbows. Yeah, that's the reality of what's going to happen on the street. The dude is going to fire, you know, fake a jab, go kick, double leg takedown, put you on the ground, and try to pound you on the ground. Is what I'm teaching going to help them with that situation, or am I just polishing? to a very, very high level, the narrowest of slivers on that pie. Mm -hmm. And so that's the thing. And that's why, as impressed as I am with some of the internal guys, it's just at the end of the day, when I look at combat in its totality, 
you have to deal with someone who doesn't care what martial arts style you do, someone who doesn't know any martial arts, but that doesn't make them less of a dangerous fighter, and they're going to come at you windmilling and grab your head and put you in a headlock and try to wail on your head and you know grab your face and kick you on the ground yeah. or whatever. That's unfortunately the reality of what we have to deal with. And I feel that my responsibility as a martial arts instructor in 2021 is to prepare my students against that and not to prepare them against, okay, get in your stance. I want you to put your hand here, try to see, you cannot push me. <laughs> because that is kind of like you're now really, really, really polishing the smallest sliver of that pie of what people need for fighting. And I think the last story I'll leave with that is that it reminds me of a very funny story about one of my senior students. A lot of funny story. Um, let's just say a teachable moment. Yeah. Uh, one of your sihangs, uh, and I'm not going to say who he is. I mentioned him before. Long-time listeners could probably figure it out. So I have a student who uh, was an actor for a long time, one of my senior students. And uh, in, you know, now he's kind of a high-level stuntman. But in the early days, he was like, you know, doing some theater. And, you know, he's the story like he built himself up from theater actor and then did TV and then movies and then stunts. And now he's like really high level. But as he's coming up through it, you know, he had to kind of pay his dues and take his lumps. And so there was a period very early on. He's learning Wing Chun from me. This is years and years ago. And he has to uh, do stage combat, which is, you know, for actors fighting on stage, how you can fake punches and kicks when you're doing like theater because it's different from film. Yeah. Because the audience is there. You have to be able to sell it. You have to make fake noises on stage. So it looks like it land. You have to know how to sell the oh, shots. Yeah. And like it's an entire art and it's called stage combat. And it's really fascinating. And we've used a lot of stage combat ideas in our demonstrations because I had a lot of experience with these stage combat guys. But as this student was coming up, you know, he wasn't yet like a choreographer. He wasn't a high level guy. He was like a stunt actor, so to speak. In that world, you have to listen to the guy who's ahead of you who can get you jobs. Mm -hmm. And whatever that guy says, you kind of got to nod and smile and do what you got to do until you become that guy. And then, you know, the, the hands change. And so as, as he was starting to do these acting gigs, you know, one of the stage combat guys who was higher than him, who was giving him jobs and he had to teach under this guy, that guy was an Aikido guy, and he's an older guy. And the problem with older guys is you can't tell them anything about martial arts because they know everything. If a dude's over 45 and been doing Aikido his whole life or karate his whole life or kung fu his whole life, no 20-something-year-old is going to come in and be like, well, actually, you shouldn't think... No. <laughs> and, and these dudes are set in their ways, right? And I've understood this as a martial arts practitioner. I, I love Wing Chun, but if someone tells me like, oh, I don't like Wing Chun, I like boxing. I'm like, cool, tell me about boxing. Like, I don't, my, my identity is not insulted if someone doesn't like my martial art. You have to realize, like, why would you get upset if someone who doesn't do your martial art, does another martial art, likes the martial art that they do and is not particularly interested in other ones? Because for most people, that's exactly what you are but for your art against yeah. other art. So literally you're in the same boat, right? It's like, I like Wing Chun. That's my primary thing. I'm not particularly interested in Aiki Jiu Jitsu, for example, okay. right? But I'll look at it. But like, that's not really my thing. But someone who does that probably has no interest in Wing Chun. And so we can have a conversation because you know what? We're exactly the same, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like like people who, who say like, oh, I can't understand how someone can be an atheist. And you can go, well, you're an atheist about Thor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah about all those other gods, right? Like you, you can imagine what it's like, right? It's two guys in two different boats on the same river. Exactly, right? So, so but people will get upset about that. But a lot of these older guys... They're very institutionalized, and they don't want to hear some young guy tell them anything about martial arts. So anyway, he knows that this student of mine, who's a stage combat actor, does Wing Chun, but he's an Aikido guy. And he's, in my opinion, a bit immature because it's like he has to now constantly say why Aikido is better than everything else, right? And so it makes my student feel uncomfortable <laughs> because my student needs to mm, kiss this guy's ass for jobs. And he needs to do what he needs to do. Mm. But this guy's kind of being an immature prick. Because I would never, if I was in that guy's position and I was a Wing Chun guy, tell some people who came to me and did karate and other martial arts, you know, the karate's actually bullshit, you should do Wing Chun, right? I mean, like, who, who, what adult speaks that way? Well, unfortunately, apparently a lot of adults speak that way, right? So anyway... You know, uh, my student was like, you know, he, he didn't really say anything and he's just like doing his thing. But like the topic of martial arts keeps coming up in rehearsals and things like that. And so he asked, I think, my student, well, what would you do if someone grabbed your wrist? 
<laughs> and uh, he said, well, I would just go forward and punch him in the face, right? Yeah. And that was not the answer he was expecting because, right. you know, he's expecting, you know, step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, and throw yeah. the guy, right? And my student was like, well, if you grab my wrist, I'd probably just punch you in the face, right? Because my other hand is free, uh. all right? And, and I think that he got a little... Because that's almost like a stand-up comedy routine, you know what I mean? Like, the one guy does this, you grab me, you just punch, right? Yeah. Or you know, it reminds me of, like, Raiders of the Lost Ark, where the guy's swinging all this stuff, and Indy just shoots him, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. the one guy, you grab the wrist, he does all these things, and things, you just, boom, why you just punch the guy, right? I mean, of course, there are other solutions we have in Wing Chun if you don't want to hit the guy. But, like, I mean, like Bruce Lee said, hey, direct, you know, the yeah. guy grabs you, stomp on his foot, like, something simple, right? Yeah. Why do you need to do this 20-step process, right? So, uh, anyway, I think the guy felt because he kind of asked Mike Yan like what would you do and Mike Yan was like I would just punch and I think the Aikido has felt like he might have lost face because what happens when you tell people about this when you tell a group this they always laugh because we say oh I do martial arts oh what would you do if I grab your wrist the people who have not done martial arts before expect well I'm going to grab and I'm going to yeah. go here I'm going to twist I'm going to do this thing and then you go you look at it and you go all right grab my wrist stronger really really hard you know what grab with two hands grab really really hard as hard as you can <laughs> boom and you punch the guy right all right and it's almost like a it's almost like a yeah. comedy punchline, right yeah. and uh i think maybe the aikido guy like lost face or whatever right Dang. and then so he goes like you know well yeah well it's some really good work like you know like go ahead you know grab my lapel or something like that and i'm going to show you like the real thing you should do first of all it goes from a wrist grab to a lapel grab or something right, like right. that right and so my student of course he has to follow this guy right and uh, so he's like, okay. So he grabs the guy's lapel. And then the guy cranks his wrist in some just nasty Aikido wrist lock, right? Yeah. And I was like, ugh. And of course, I, I taught my student, like, someone grabs you, tries to lock your wrist. You do this, you do that. And then, but, like, when he grabbed this Aikido guy, the Aikido guy, like, like you know, messed up his wrist, right? And he was like, oh, see if I felt so bad because, like, you know, he asked me to do it, so I did it. And, like, but he really hurt me, actually. Right. Because he had to, like, he had to, like, show how tough he was or something like that, right? And he goes, and he goes, oh, and, you know, what would, and then he asked me, like, well, you know, Siva, what would you do if someone did this wrist lock on you? Mm -hmm. And I go, well, if you, you grab someone's lapel and someone puts you in this wrist lock, I go, they're going to, no, I mean, they're going to crank your wrist and they're going to break your wrist. Yeah. But I go, but Mike, when will you ever grab someone's lapel that way? (laughs) I go, uh, let's backtrack a moment. Did he tell you to grab his lapel? Yeah. Yes. Did he tell you where to grab his lapel? Yeah, he told me to grab right there. Did he tell you how with one hand, two hand, overhand grip, whatever? Yeah, he told me to grab like this and grab it. So he told you exactly how to grab his lapel, which lapel to grab, how to grab it, and you did it. (laughs) (laughs) No. Okay? Yeah. Of course, we know this story. But if you were ever applying your Wing Chun mic, I guarantee you, it doesn't start with a lapel grab. You wouldn't go up to something. I mean, what is this, the 1930s? You grab some why yeah, you ought to grab your lapel and take you outside and give you a rogering, right? I mean, like, what is this? Okay? No one does that. And, of course, if you're so stupid to do that and the guy knows Aikido, you deserve yeah. to get your wrist broken in 80 places, all right? Okay. But, of course, the guy went really hard. And my student felt a little upset because I've shown him how to like, yield to locks and stuff like that, and he couldn't do it. Yeah, of course, because in that situation, you're already caught in it. Like if people say, oh, do you get out of a rear naked choke? Well, you have to learn how to prevent it and how to avoid it because if it's already in, Mm-mm. high-level grapplers cannot get out of a rear naked choke if that thing is already in, mm. right? You have to learn, you know, there's a procedure to avoid it if it's on the ground or whatever. But, like, the same thing with, like, how do you get out of a wrist lock when you fully invested in everything the guy needs to put you a wrist lock you're in the wrist lock and it's over right yeah. so that was kind of like kind of the issue with that you trapped right? yeah and so yeah you know in new york we say that's pissing on my leg and telling me that it's raining <laughs> and that's all i gotta say about that all right kung fu genius fans well what do you think about today's episode and what questions do you want me to answer on a future episode of the kung fu genius Write those in the comments below, and I'll see you guys next time. Word is I'm a kung fu genius. Technique speaks for me, not lineage. Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one. Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Si Kung, and I produce masters. You surpassed us, your kung fu stiffer than corpse and caskets. City Wing Chung is the house I built. Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt. Alex Richter, always the- Wow. We did the goddamn mountains. 
<laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah, yo, F-bomb. what's up with F bombs here, F-bomb. son? Here's a question for your next Q and A. All right. <laughs> the style I read it too. This is totally different yeah, from you, the Dreisen question. But you also give everyone a little bit of a flavor that yeah. it's probably nothing at all like their personal character. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to it. Holy cow, he did it! Bloody he did hell. it! This is what happens when he goes on vacation. That's what we do. We need to send you away more often. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my god, does that mean that's the end of the line? Is that the end of the series? Do we not do this anymore? We need to replace this dude. He has become the bird and he can fly away now to go into the world. Yes, absolutely. So no, what me. made it easy, I didn't have to read it. Because you realize it's the same thing every time?